turn-based RPGs are my bread and butter, and so is the Super Nintendo. So putting the two of them together makes a delicious butter sim- <laughs> Who writes this stuff? Okay, intros aren't my forte, but you know what is? Concise titles and talking about the games that I'm hyped for. I'm Super Derek, and these are the 10 or so turn-based Japanese-style role-playing games on Super Nintendo that I'm hyped to replay or play for the first time. At the bottom of the list is that game that's near and dear to my heart, the original Breath of Fire. And while I love the game, it's at the bottom of this list because honestly, I know it's mostly a roast into glasses thing. Sure, the visuals are outstanding and the dragon transformations are incredibly overpowered yet fun. The protagonist is an absolute stud with his cape and blue hair, but this game has aged pretty poorly and it's hard to return to if you're not already in the right state of mind. Like the masochistic kind, because the encounter rate of this game is likely a huge reason that people absolutely hate random encounters. But even so, I have an immense amount of nostalgia for using Karn to fuse with a bunch of different characters to form the ultimate death machine, shooting wild boars on the world map, piloting a giant stone mecha, and saving a village of Romero from a zombie invasion. When I first reviewed Breath of Fire nearly a decade ago, I already had nostalgia for the game, and now I have even more nostalgia for those early YouTube days when my review of the Breath of Fire series felt like my first big hit, where I was truly finding my voice. So Breath of Fire has an extra special spot in my heart. I know I'll replay the game someday, and I'm looking forward to it. Just... not today. Coming in at number 2 on this list is Robotrek, a weird turn-based RPG you've probably never heard of or cared about, but if you're as old as I am, you might recognize the frustratingly generic box art from a shelf at your local grocery store's video rental nook. You know, sitting next to that copy of Phalanx that also nobody rented because when you're 12, judging games by their cover is pretty much all the time your mom gave you to do. But Phalanx is actually a pretty cool game, and so is Robotrek. This game was developed by Quintet, the guys behind half of my favorite action RPGs of all time. It's crazy that I never got to experience this until a few years ago, considering what a huge fan of Quintet games I am. This game is not like those, though, sadly. It doesn't quite live up to the somber storytelling and surprisingly mature and thought-provoking themes of Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, or Terranigma. Oh man, don't get me started on those games. Actually, that sounds like a pretty nice topic for another video. Subscribe so you don't miss it. But back to Robotrek. This is a turn-based RPG originally called Slapstick in which you play as the inventor boy who builds and maintains robots who fights his battles for him. The story is kind of forgettable though, but the combat system is really interesting, where different combos can be pre-programmed into your fighting robos to create new, devastating special attacks against a series of enemies on the screen. It's a unique and weird, and do you know what? Weird is honestly just a perfect summary for this game, and it just doesn't live up to the hype that I built up in my own mind as a long-lost title by Quintet. Remember kids, hype responsibly. So it's a game that I suspect would benefit from me giving it another look at some point, but at the same time, my faded memory of the story paired with the overwhelming levels of whimsy just don't thrust this game into the upper echelons of my gotta play it again list. Super Mario RPG is a game that I always thought looked incredible on the SNES, especially when I first played it on an emulator on an early version of ZSNES back in the day. However, Super Mario RPG is weirdly one of the games that just didn't stick for me at the time. I was definitely more preoccupied with blue-haired protagonists by this point in my life, and plumbers just weren't cool anymore. So it wasn't until much later in life that I actually returned to this game to finish what I had started when I was 12. And by much later in life, I mean like two years ago. And what I found was a wildly endearing RPG featuring some of the most iconic characters from my childhood. Mario's pantomime speech and slapstick humor is incredibly charming, and the infantilization of Bowser to make him out to be some misunderstood sensitive bully made him out to be an incredibly fun person to watch. Also, you can't tell me this wasn't the first step that would eventually lead to the way he was portrayed by Jack Black in the new Super Mario Bros. movie. The turn-based fighting mechanics with real-time button presses for combos was probably invented here too, which would later play a huge inspiration behind more recent titles like The Legend of Dragoon and Shadow Hearts. But if Super Mario RPG is so great, why is it so low on this list? Well, I already kind of foreshadowed this explanation when I told you moments ago I beat this game for my review just a couple of years ago. Feels like I just played the game only yesterday, and with the backlog as large as mine, finding excuses to replay the same game over and over feels like a Sisyphean exercise in insanity. Plus, with a newly announced remake coming straight out of left field and right onto the Nintendo Switch, the appeal of replaying the game on Super Nintendo is dampened somewhat. 
Next up on the list is one of my favorite games of all time, and statistically speaking, one of your favorite games of all time too, because the Super Nintendo is known for its turn-based RPGs, despite the fact that there were only actually something like 15 turn-based Japanese-style RPGs that we got in the West. Did you know that? But even so, the SNES is renowned for its incredible RPG library because quality wins over quantity, and no game exemplifies that quite like Chrono Trigger, a game that takes only about 25 hours to complete, but takes a lifetime to get over. Chrono Trigger is held in such high renown at this point that it's practically a meme, but it's for good reason. The game eschews the tedium of random encounters, tosses away the idea of a battle screen, and innovates in ways that have only just recently newer titles are beginning to replicate. Pairing these accessible game mechanics with stunning visuals on the Super Nintendo and iconic art by the legendary Akira Toriyama and timeless music from Yas Norimitsura, Chrono Trigger flirts with perfection. The game meshes sci-fi time travel storytelling flawlessly with swords and sorcery fantasy, ancient forgotten magics with somber post-apocalyptic doomsday scenarios. Honestly, at this point, I'm just gushing about Chrono Trigger, but I already have a video dedicated exactly to that. So why again is this game in the lower half of this list? Uh, because I literally just played it and got several optional endings, so I'm probably good to wait at least a couple more months before diving back into Guardia yet again, because this is probably my most replayed game of all time, and I'm sure it won't be long before I do it again. We're halfway through this list, and I still haven't mentioned the game that actually started me on my descent into turn-based role-playing madness. Earthbound is the game that literally changed my life and is single-handedly the reason that I've dedicated the last decade of my life to exploring the genre, and ironically it's also probably the game that's least like any other on this list. Earthbound, like Chrono Trigger, is consistently nearing the tops of everybody's top 10 lists on the Super Nintendo, RPGs or otherwise, and back when I first played this game, I hated it. It was my first turn-based RPG, and I just didn't get it at all. I was expecting a game like A Link to the Past, so suffice it to say, when I got in my first combat scenario and was greeted by this trippy screen with menus and a static picture of a crow, I felt in over my head. Legitimately, for a solid few seconds there, I probably thought my Super Nintendo was glitching. I mean, just look at this background. But eventually, I figured it out over a long summer with no games to play. Maybe it was Stockholm Syndrome, but eventually I fell in love with the game's kooky depiction of my neighborhood and my town and my country, depiction of the bullies and the adults who ruled my life. Sure, mechanically it's a Dragon Quest clone, but this localization by Marcus Lindblom and others gave this game such a vibe that every time I replay the game, it's not just the feeling of returning home again, it's more than that. It's transporting to a completely different time as well. Nowadays, I know that Earthbound ain't for everyone. Earthbound has gone on to inspire dozens of newer titles like Undertale that have garnered their own cult followings, but even so, I relish the opportunity to talk about Earthbound every chance I get, or even just to play through the game for a few minutes from time to time, which is why even though I've replayed the game relatively recently, I'd still love to take another shot at it. It's practically an annual tradition at this point, after all. Hey guys, did you know Final Fantasy 2 was actually known as Final Fantasy 4 in Japan? Yes. Yes, I do. Everybody knows that at this point, but if I didn't say it here, somebody in the comments would feel the need to say it again. That said, what you might not know about Final Fantasy 2 is that it was the first Final Fantasy title that I ever played, and low-key might be the most underappreciated SNES RPG of all because of its brother that I ain't talking about right now because it's time for Final Fantasy 2 to shine. This game blew me away. The story of Cecil, or Cecil? Cain and his two best friends in the evil empire doing evil things together until one of them realizes that doing evil things is bad so he becomes good. And this whole moveset changes and he gets some new cool armor, but Kane stays bad. Or is he just mind controlled? Who knows? Plus, here's Rydia and she can summon stuff now. This game has airships too and you can fly around the world and go literally anywhere. Man, I can't believe I haven't replayed this game once in the last 10 years or so. If Earthbound introduced me to JRPGs, Final Fantasy 2 was definitely the game that solidified that love. And even as I write this entry, I'm toying with the idea of moving Final Fantasy 2 up in the list a rung or two, but man, I have other games I've never played ahead of me, and some games that I've just never finished. So I really should cross some games off the list first, right? 
games like The Seventh Saga, which I have never played before. This one's made by a company called Produce, who also made Brain Lord, the second game that I ever reviewed. And just like Brain Lord, it's got that derpy top-down perspective that makes all of your characters look like they have gigantic shoulders and tiny legs. <laughs> I mean, it's an admirable attempt at realism, but boy does this ever look funny when you're used to looking at games like Final Fantasy or Chrono Trigger. Honestly, I don't know enough about this game to even talk about it in this list, except that it heavily uses Mode 7 graphics during combat. It's a turn-based RPG, of course, unlike Brain Lord, which is an action RPG, but otherwise it looks pretty similar in a lot of ways. But it's because I know so little about this game, and I hear about it being mentioned by so many of you, that it actually outranks every other game that I've talked about so far. Almost. Okay, I changed my mind. I'm moving Final Fantasy II up on the list. Sorry, Seventh Saga, you'll just have to wait a little bit longer. But now let's take a look at another RPG that I've never touched. It's called Arcana, and if you saw the cover art, it's no wonder you never rented this game back in the day either. Nothing about this indicates to me that it is a game worth checking out, but take a look at the Japanese cover. It's another turn-based RPG by Halkin on the... Wait, Halkin made this? They made Earthbound in collaboration with Nintendo, and I have not played this? What the heck, man? Okay, so anyways, it's called Cardmaster back on the Super Famicom, which is way more indicative of what this game is all about. You play as a Cardmaster who uses cards to fight bad guys. It's also a first-person dungeon crawler, and okay, that's why I never played this game before. But I have it on good authority that this game is actually pretty good. Again, I don't have any sort of stories to tell you about this game or experiences playing it, which is why I'm honestly pretty excited to give this a shot someday. Variety is the spice of life, and just to prove it, I actually ordered a copy already. Breaking my streak of not collecting retro games. So maybe it'll show up in a review someday. Next up, you knew this was going to be on this list somewhere. Final Fantasy 3. I can't not mention this game because just like Earthbound, just like Chrono Trigger, just like Super Mario RPG, this game tops everyone's list of the best RPGs on the Super Nintendo. So what does this game got that the others don't? Well, I've never finished Final Fantasy 3. Hey, did you know this game was called Final Fantasy C Yes! Yes, we know, and yeah, I can hear your gasps from here, fake fan, blah blah blah, but the fact is I've intentionally avoided playing and reviewing the Final Fantasy series on YouTube because there are literally hundreds of reviews of these games out there already. You didn't need me to tell you if this game was any good. I didn't want my channel to be that one who showed up and talked about the five good Final Fantasy games and called it a day with nothing left to say. And while I played Final Fantasy 3 on an emulator, and I think I got pretty far, I ended up getting stuck somewhere during a pivotal moment in the game and moved on to Breath of Fire or something. That's always been one of my problems with emulation. Indecision overload made committing to actually beating a game way too hard for me. Especially because I'd always want to cherish the final moments of a game, I'd never want to ride to the end. So instead of playing games through to the end like they deserve, I would see the writing on the wall and I would feel overwhelmed by the odds stacked against me. Several games did this to me back in the day. Lufia in the Fortress of Doom, Breath of Fire 3, Soul Blazer and Super Mario RPG, and Final Fantasy 3 is... I think the last game on my list that I've left on hold. This is one of the last big ones that I need to cross off my bucket list, and it's nearly that time I give this game the time that it demands from me. Next up on this list is another classic that I've never finished, or worse yet, one that I've never even played before. Not so long ago, Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals was a game that very few people knew or cared about, but gradually this game has been getting a lot more attention and love, which blew my mind because you might notice that the original Lufia in the Fortress of Doom wasn't even on this list at all. I have no desire to replay that game again. So when I eventually heard that the prequel would actually be worth my time, I made a point of picking it up. It's been my plan to hold off on playing this, one of the last great classics, until I had completed and reviewed over a hundred RPGs prior. Well, 
that goal has been met. Several such self-imposed limitations have been lifted. The weighted training clothing can come off, and Super Derek is about to be unleashed. And when I do, this game had better hold up to all of your hype because you guys, I have told you time and time again to hype responsibly, and if I play this game and it sucks like Lufio 1 did, I am going to be so disappointed in myself and all of you. Do you hear me? Hey, where the heck do you think you're going? Get back here! Oh, you, you came back? Cool. Then let me tell you a little secret. There's more than 10 games on this list. This one is the secret game that I most hyped for. I held one back just for you. The real ones. The ones who subscribed and rang the bell to get all of those notifications. I see you. And this one's a curveball just for you. Breath of Fire 2 is a game that I had really high hopes and expectations for. It's a truly grand RPG on the Super Nintendo. The story is epic, and the visuals were a huge leap forward from the original. But while Breath of Fire 1 was mostly a basic RPG with a bland story and some really cool ideas, it had a serviceable translation by Squaresoft. Breath of Fire 2, on the other hand, was far more fleshed out, had everything it needed to be an incredible experience. Everything, that is except for a decent localization. Sadly, Capcom got sticker shop from the Squaresoft job from Breath of Fire 1 and decided they'd do things in-house for Breath of Fire 2. And the results are... bad. Especially a certain frog with a certain French ridiculous accent. But despite everything, this game left a little impact on me. And a long time ago, I heard about a fan project to completely re-translate the game. And in fact, improve the game in a number of ways. The Breath of Fire 2 Fan Retranslation Patch. And that's the real SNES title that I am incredibly hyped to play for the first time. To replay the game that I've already experienced, but to be able to enjoy it even more because things make actual sense. Breath of Fire started off this list but it also finishes this list, thanks to an incredible team of talented fans. And I cannot wait to sink my teeth into this one. And someday I will. But if you'll excuse me, first, I have some more fake fan comments I need to get back to deleting from my inbox. See you on the next one, everybody.